Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson. In this lesson and tomorrow's lesson, we'll be revising physics in preparation for your paper on Friday. Um, and at the moment, we're talking about the government physics paper. Right, so we got as far as, not yesterday, but the day before, we were busy working um, on this question. And we got as far as it said, calculate the magnitude and direction of the net electrostatic force exerted on K due to charges J and L. Um, so we'd got as far as realizing that this object is going to this particle K is going to be pushed by L to the left and it's going to be attracted down due to the force of J, so it's going to end up with a resultant over here. But it says calculate the magnitude and direction, so the first thing we need to do is work out the force, in this case we're working out the force of L on K, so we're working out the force of L on K, and we'd got as far as that, and we hadn't got any further, so now let's get out our calculator and work out exactly what that force is. So let's clear this and let's work it out. So we need a fraction. I'm going to 9 exponent negative 9 multiplied by, oh, sorry, I forgot that I wasn't supposed to touch it, 2 exponent negative 6 multiplied by 8 exponent negative 6 all divided by uh, a bracket 0 0.1 bracket squared equals and that is 1.44 times 10 to negative 17 so that equals 1,44 times 10 to the negative 17. So that force there is 1 comma 4 4 times by 10 to the negative 17. Now we're going to do exactly the same thing but we're going to work out the force of J on K. So the force of J on K is the same. It's going to be 9 times by 10 to the 9. The Q, one of the Qs is going to be 2 times by 10 to negative 6 because it's micro. The other one is going to be 4. And remember I said to you, don't have to worry about the pluses and minuses because the pluses and minuses just really show us in which direction this thing is going to be attracted or repelled. And that's how we worked out these directions. So this is 4 times by 10 to negative 6. But we do need to change this 50 millimeters into meters. And in order to do that, we need to divide by a thousand, and I've already done it there, and that becomes 0, 0, 5. So that's 0, 0, 5 all squared. So let's pop that into our calculator. So I'm actually just gonna go up. What does Nike wanna go up? Uh, let's go back. And let's go back. And first of all, let's change this um, to naught five. Okay. And then let's go up in the same thing. And then this must be deleted. This eight must be changed to four exponent negative six. And then we go equals, and we end up with 2.88 times 10 to the negative 17. So that there, this direction here is 2,88 times 10 to the negative 17. So that means that I could actually move this over here, and this would be 2,88 times by 10 to the negative 17. So now finally, we just need to work out the resultant, and we can do that with Pythagoras, and then we need to find an angle so that we can find the direction. Okay, so let's do that. Let's first use Pythagoras. So Pythagoras is going to be this one squared plus this one squared square rooted is going to give us F res. So F res 
is equal to the square root of f of l on k squared plus f of j on k squared. Right, so let's do that. So we've got the two values, so it's going to be 1.44. Let's put them in brackets here just to make it clear. So it's going to be 1.44. Exponent negative 17 close bracket squared plus um, open bracket. This is 2.88 exponent negative. Um, let's try again, delete negative. 17 bracket squared equals and then we square root the answer and that's going to give us 3.22 times by 10 to the negative 17 so this year is 3 comma 22 times by 10 to the negative 17 3 comma 2 2 times by 10 to the negative 17 what? Newtons. So the magnitude is 3 comma 2 2 times by 10 to the negative 17 Newtons. And now they want the direction, so we need to find an angle. So I would use Sokotoa, but I would use this side and this side because we worked them out first, okay? So I'm going to use Sokotoa. Toa. Okay, and I've got the adjacent side and I've got the opposite side, so I'm using tan. So I can say tan theta is the opposite side, which is 2 comma 8, 8 times by 10. So negative 17 over the adjacent, which is 1 comma 4, 4 times by 10 to the negative 17. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to work that out. So we're going to go shift tan bracket of 2.88 exponent negative 17 all over 1.44 exponent negative 17 and we're going to close the bracket and that will give us our angle oh did i just go tan i meant to be negative tan mm -hmm. Hmm, delete, there we go, shift, tan, there we go, equals, much better, 63.43 degrees, so theta, the angle is going to be 63,43 degrees, um, down from the horizontal, down from horizontal. Or you could make this a bearing, but that's fine. Okay, right, now I'm gonna raise all the writing we've got so far on the side, and then I'm gonna go find it over here and do this, and then, no, not that, and do this, and then go delete, and then we're gonna do the rest of this question. Um, so I'm gonna go back to this, and it says, Defining words electric field point, electric field at a point. Okay, so obviously you need to go look at your definitions, um, and that's you're going to find in your um, exam guidelines, which I've told you several times um, that you need to get your hands on. Um, but 
basically you could say that a region around a charged particle or object within which a force would be exerted on another charge on other charged particles or objects or another way you could say it is that electric field at a point is the force with which is the force with which a particle hang on the electric field at a point is defined as electric force per unit charge okay the electric force per unit charge let's try and say that again electric force per unit charge. Now I know that's not the official exam guideline definition, but it is the one that you're going to need when you are looking for the SI units that you need to use, I mean the equation you need to use, on your formula sheet. So if you look at your formula sheet, I'm sorry, I'm just paging you to get to mine. If you look at the formula sheet, you, what did we say? That the electric field is the force per unit charge. So obviously we're looking at E, is equal to F over Q. F over Q. Okay, so we've just worked out the magnitude of the net electric field, which I can't remember. So do you agree that to work out the magnitude of the electric field at K, all you would have to do is use our F net, which we've just worked out. Um, actually, I think it'll be on my calculator. Hang on a second. It will. Let me go up. Mm, there it is, 3.22 times by 10 to negative 17. There we go. So that is 3,22 times by 10 to negative 17, 17 over the charge of K. And the charge of K is 2 times by 10 to negative 6. So that's all we have to do with this. So let's go do that. So it's going to be 3.22 exponent negative 17, negative 17 divided by 2 exponent negative 6 equals, and you get 1.66 times by 10 to the negative 11. 1.61 equals 1 comma 61 times by 10 to the negative 11. And what is the unit for your electric field strength? It is Newtons per coulomb. Newtons per coulomb. It's a pretty easy one, hey? Right. Now let's look at this question, okay? This is a nice electricity question. It says a battery is connected to four resistors and two switches. So there's a random resistor we don't know. Yeah, here is four ohms, three ohms, four ohms. Yes, switch one and yes, switch two. Okay. It says when switch one is open and no current flows, the voltmeter reading across the terminals is 18 volts. So what are they telling us? They're telling us that the EMF of the battery is 18 volts. That's what they're telling us. It says write down the term that describes the, oh, I've just done it, EMF, done. Now it says with both switches closed, and okay, what does it say? The voltmeter decreases by, by 0 0.9 volts, and the ammeter reads 4.5 amps. Okay, so the ammeter reads 4,5 amps, and the new voltmeter reading is going to be 17,1 volts. Okay, so this bit here must be the last volts. The last volts. It says write down the term that describes the voltmeter reading when both the switches are closed. Okay, this is the volts that are actually going to the circuit. Okay, that's the volts actually going to the circuit. It says calculate the internal resistance. Okay, so do you agree the last volts equals I times by the internal resistance? But we know that the last volt is 0 0.9. So we've got 0 0.9 equals the current of 4,5 times by R. 
So therefore, R is going to be 0, 9 divided by 4, 5. So let's go find my calculator. We've got 0, 0.9 divided by 4.5 equals 0, 2. So R is 0, 2 ohms. So the internal resistance is 0, 2 ohms. Now it says which of the resistors in parallel carries the largest current. Write down only 4 ohms or 3 ohms and explain your answer. Okay, so you need to understand that the current is going to go through, more current is going to go through the smaller resistor. So therefore we can say that the correct answer is 3 ohms and the reason is that V is equal to IR, V parallel is always equal, so if the R is decreased, that means the I must be increased. Okay, pretty easy, okay, right? Now it says calculate R. Okay, we can do that. So we first have to work out the effective resistance of the whole circuit, right? So, I mean, of these parallel, so it's going to be 1 over R parallel is 1 over 4 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. So, do you agree that common denominator is 12? So, that goes 3 plus 4 plus 3. So, that's 7 plus 3 is 10 over 12. And that's one of our parallel. And now you've got to be very careful because when you are working this out and you are showing your working, you really, really, really need to show that therefore our parallel is 12 divided by 10, which is 1 comma 2 ohms. So the whole of this, the whole of these parallel resistors can be replaced by one resistor, which is 1 comma 2 ohms. Okay, so now oh, I don't need this internal resistance because I've got the last volts, so I can erase this. So now we know the volts to the circuit, volts to the circuit or the external volts, the volts to the circuit is equal to I multiplied by big R. We know that this is going to be 17 comma 1 because they told us that it was EMF was 18, but it lost 0 0.9, so therefore it's 17 comma 1. We know that the current is 4 comma 5, therefore we can find out the total resistance. Therefore the total resistance is going to be 17 comma 1 divided by 4 comma 5. So the total resistance of the external circuit is 17.1 divided by divided by 4.5 which equals 3.8 3 comma 8 ohms but of that 1.2 is the parallel component so we can subtract 1 comma 2 and we're left with 2 comma 6 ohms so therefore this resistor is made up of 2 comma 6 ohms okay right now it says name one environmental factor that could cause the resistance of r to change name the one environmental factor that could cause the resistance of r to change environmental factor um, I'm not 100% sure what they mean by that question. Um, it says, name, I suppose, temperature, because the greater the temperature, yeah, it would have to be temperature, because the greater the temperature, the higher the resistance of the metal would be. Okay, so if this had to suddenly get heated up, we would suddenly have huge amounts of resistance compared to some, what we've got at the moment. Right, now it says, switch S is now open. Okay, what will happen to the voltmeter reading? Will the voltmeter reading increase, decrease, or stay the same? Explain your answer without doing a calculation. Okay, so let's think about this. If this is gone, what has happened to the total resistance of the circuit? Do you agree that the total resistance of the circuit has increased? 
okay so if the total resistance has increased do you agree that we need more energy to go around hang on wait it's total resistance is increased yes the total resistance increase i just need to write that the other way around just wait our total our total has increased why is it increased because the more resistors you have in parallel the smaller the resistance so our total has decreased okay we know that the emf is equal to um i big r plus i little r which can be rewritten as i r plus little r okay the actual emf of the circuit can't change right the big r has increased but because the big r has increased the current is going to decrease okay the current is going to decrease but that also means that that current decreases which means the internal resistance therefore big v has to go up okay another way you can think of it is this if the resist total resistance of the circuit is increased then you require more energy to get everything around the circuit and if that's the case then your voltage has got to increase that's another way of thinking of it okay right next question okay so now we're talking alternating current ac generators DC motors, root mean square velocity, mean volts, etc., etc. Okay, so what are they saying? They're saying that an alternating current, an AC generator, installed on a farm produces the following graph of EMF, the volts versus time. So it's 84.8 is the maximum voltage, and you can see that that there is its frequency. So this is the period of one wave, 0.1 seconds okay it says what is the prepared for one rotation armature there you go it is naught comma one second from here to here is one wavelength i mean one full turn and therefore that there is the period of one rotation it says calculate the root mean square voltage okay so we know that Sorry, I'm just, <clears throat> my throat's sore. Um, we know that um, your IMAX equals, no, wait, let me try again. Um, your I root mean square is equal to your IMAX. over square root two and we know that a v root mean square is equal to v max over root two okay so now they've given us the maximum voltage and they want the root mean square so we're going to be using this formula okay so therefore we can say it's pretty easy therefore that we can say that V root mean square is equal to 84,8 divided by root 2. So it becomes 84.8 divided by square root 2 equals 59.96. So it's equal to 59,96 volts. So that's about over there. 59,96 volts. Okay, done. Now it says an ohmic light bulb, which means it obeys Ohm's law. An ohmic light bulb is rated 100 volts, 40 watts is supplied with energy calculate the resistance of the light bulb okay so we are told that the power is equal to 100 volts i mean let's try again we are told <laughs> sorry we are told that the power is equal to 40 watts we are told that the volts 
of the saying is 100 volts and it's supplied with the energy from this generator, okay? It says calculate the resistance. Okay, so we know that P um, equals VI, which equals I squared R, which equals V squared over R. Okay, now the bulb is rated 100 volts, but it's not getting 100 volts. It's only getting 59.96 volts. Okay, it can't get 100 volts. That is its maximum amount of voltage that it can get to, okay, that it can take. But it's only getting 59.96 volts. So we are going to work with the power and we're going to work with the 59.96 volts to work out its resistance. Oh, no, we're not. Sorry. We're going to use 100 volts to work out this, okay? But then we're going to use 9.3.2 to answer the fact that, okay. So, we're going to go P is equal to V squared over R. Therefore, R is going to be V squared over P, which is 100 squared over 40. So, let's find out our calculator. So it's 100 squared divided by 40 equals 250. So therefore, this is 250 ohms. So the resistance of this light bulb is 250 ohms. Now it says, describe the lightness of the light bulb under these conditions. Choose from too bright, correct brightness, or too dim. And the correct answer is going to be too dim. And the reason, because it's rated at 100 volts, it needs 100 volts to give the, this power of 40 watts. But it doesn't have the 100 volts. It only has 59.96 volts. So it doesn't have enough power. Finally, it says, draw a graph of current strength versus time over the same interval time interval do not show any values guys the current strength is going to be exactly the same graph exactly the same graph except that it's not going to have numbers on it i'm not drawing it okay moving on right photoelectric effect the photoelectric effect they love giving the graphs these days okay they really do so make sure you know how to do them it says, a group of physicists perform an experiment where they shine five different light sources, A, B, C, D, E, onto a platinum cathode of a photocell. They measure the maximum kinetic energies, this is EK max, of the ejected photoelectrons and produce the following. So here's the frequency, and that's K max. It says, what does the gradient of this above graph represent? Okay, so let's think about this. Do you agree? that the formula says for this, says that E is equal to W0 plus EK, okay? But W, this would be HF is equal to, I'm gonna get there, is equal to the work function plus EK, right? Um, and this is, sorry, the frequency, this is plotted the frequency of the different light sources versus the kinetic energy. So, do you agree that I could rearrange this to say that EK is equal to HF minus the work function, where this would be my Y, F would be my X value, this would be my C, and H is my gradient. So the gradient represents Planck's constant. There we go. Now it says define the term threshold frequency. Again, you need to look at your exam guidelines to make sure you've got the exact perfect definition. But basically it's saying that the um, threshold frequency is the minimum frequency required in order for one electron to be ejected from a metal. Now it says, use the x-intercept of the graph to determine the 
it wanted to calculate the work function of the metal. Okay, this x intercept is the threshold frequency because yeah, there is no kinetic energy. So that's the threshold frequency. The work function is equal to h times by the threshold frequency. So Planck's constant is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. Now we need to multiply by the threshold frequency. Now you need to be careful in how you read this, okay? This is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So that is 1 comma 2 times, and then you have to be careful of this, times by 10 to the power of 15. Okay, so let us now work that out using our calculator. So you're going to go 6.63 exponent negative 34 multiplied by 1.22 exponent 15 equals 7.956. Now remember, you always round off to two decimal places. So in this case, it's 956. You look at the third one, that being six, so you're going to round it up. So it's 7.96 times by 10 to negative 19. So it's 7,96 times by 10, negative 19. And remember, it is an energy, so it's joules. There we go. So this is 7,96 times by 10 to negative 19 joules. Now it says in one of the experiments, the brightness of one of the light sources was increased. How would this affect? And you can answer only increase or decrease, it remains the same. For the following, the number of electrons ejected per second, it's going to increase it. The only thing that the a brightness effect is the number of electrons ejected per second. It has no influence, none whatsoever, on the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the electron will remain the same. Okay, finally it says calculate the speed of the ejected electron when light source E is used. E. Okay, it says calculate. So we can work that out because we can read off the graph that its kinetic energy is 2.4. Okay, so the EK is 2,4 times by 10 to the negative 18 joules, right? But that is equal to half mv squared, right? So if that's the case, then do you agree we can say, well, then we've got the mass of an electron. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. No, it's not. It's 9.11 times by 10 to the minus 31. So this is equal to half times 9,11 times by 10 to the minus 31 v squared. So do you agree if I divide both sides by this, I will get v squared and then I can square root. So let's do that. So we're going to take the kinetic energy we've measured, which is 2.4 exponent, 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 negative 18, and we're going to divide it by bracket 0.5 times the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 exponent negative 31, close bracket, equals, and then we're going to square root the answer, square root the answer, equals. Phew, so this velocity is really big. It is 2295416. So let's just wait. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it is going to be 2.3 times by 10 to the 6 meters per second. So the velocity is going to be 2,3 times by 10 to the 6 meters per second. Sure, that is very fast. 
Right, now we get to start again on the next type of paper, the next paper. And you can see that we've gone back to looking at forces and we're looking at forces in tensions in ropes. Okay, so let's get started with this straight away. We've got five more minutes, so we can do quite a bit for this. It says block X has a mass of four kgs and is connected to block Y with mass 8 kgs by light and extensible strings. So what are they saying? There's, we don't have to worry about the mass and we don't have to worry it's not stretchy. It says another light and extensible string is attached to block X and runs over frictions pulley. Again, nothing to worry about. The system is pulled by means of a constant force of 180 newtons. So you need to understand that that means that the force up is 180 newtons. This pulley is really just allowing us to pull like this to make it easier for us, okay? But it's actually pulling the stuff up. So therefore there's a force up of 180 newtons, okay? Right, now we need to think about the rest of the question. It says state Newton's second law in motion. So this Newton's second law in motion is basically F net is equal to mass times acceleration. But if you write that in the exams, you're going to get a big that zero for your answer. Obviously, you need to obviously write down the proper definition. And again, I'm going to stipulate that you need to go check this on the exam guidelines. But basically, it's saying that a net force, when a net force acts on an object, that an object will accelerate with an acceleration that is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to its mass. Therefore, F net equals MA. Okay, so that's the basis of Newton's second law. But what are they really trying to tell you? They're trying to tell you, hint, hint, you're going to be needing Newton's second law in order to solve this question. That's what they're really doing by asking you what about Newton's second law. Now they said, draw a free, a free body diagram, a labeled free body diagram of this um, object X. So let's do it. Here's a free body diagram. Remember your free body diagram is big dot or colored in circle as one of my students always says. Okay, let's think about the force setting it. We agree there's a force up of 180 newtons. We also have a force down of the force of gravity of Y. Okay, in other words, the mass of Y, the force of Y. We also have the force down of due to gravity, force of gravity of, oh, there's a better way of writing this down. Let me, let me, let me fix this, let me fix this eraser. Um, let's call this T. So this is T, which is the force of Y, and the force of gravity. So those are the forces that are acting on X, okay? Now, I know they didn't ask you to, but in order to be able to do this sum properly, you need to draw a free body diagram of a Y, okay? So this is X, and it really does help you to draw a free body diagram of Y. And the free body diagram of Y says T is up, and the force of gravity on Y is down, okay? Right, do you agree? Now it says, calculate the tension T in the string connecting the two blocks. Okay, and that is where we'll leave it and that's what we'll start with tomorrow. So you guys are very welcome to um, do these questions ahead of me tomorrow. Um, or do this question ahead of me tomorrow and then you're welcome to join me. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us. Have a great day.